Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 992 of the Juice Box Podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Hannah. She was diagnosed when she was 12 years old and is now 26. As we recorded this, Hannah had an 18-month-old child, said her diabetes management was terrific through her pregnancy, but lost focus after the birth. And that's why we call this episode, Hannah Reinspired. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juicebox podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. You know, I never record that. I always say it on every episode. And somebody recently said, oh, I thought you just recorded that and played it over and over again. It broke my heart because apparently I could have done that. Uh, If you want to help my heart feel better, go to drinkag1.com forward slash juice box and start using AG1 with my drink or with my drink, with my link, or go to cozyearth.com, buy a whole bunch of comfortable stuff and use the offer code juice box at checkout and save 40% or, 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 Join the private Facebook group, Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes, or tell a friend about the podcast. Uh, Those are all the wonderful things you could do to make me happy. This episode of the Juicebox Podcast is sponsored by Cozy Earth. I uh, wear Cozy Earth joggers, sweatshirt, I sleep on Cozy Earth sheets, and I dry my bits off after a shower with Cozy Earth towels. I just uh, bought a bunch of stuff with my own money but I used my offer code, so I saved 40%. You can too. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout at CozyEarth.com to save 40% off of your entire order. Not one item, not just stuff on one tab, the whole website, 40%. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout. Today's podcast is also sponsored by US Med. Now, US Med is the place where we get Arden's Diabetes Supplies. You can also get your diabetes supplies from U.S. Med. They'll do it for, like, anybody whose insurance they take. And they take, like, over 800 private insurances. My point is usmed.com forward slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. You go to the link or you call the number. You get your free benefits check. If they take your insurance, and I'm telling you they take, like, over 800 of them, so I mean, probably take your insurance, uh, then you get going and you get your supplies the same way we do from U.S. Med. My name is Hannah, and I am a type 1 diabetic, uh, diagnosed at 12, and I am now 26 years old, and I'm a daily listener. So this is kind of uh, weird talking to you because I hear your voice every day, but I don't, you don't know me. (laughs) What do you mean, I don't know you? I'm talking to you every day, Hannah. (laughs) Exactly. When you, yeah, I'm in your closet. Yes. Right now. It's hard. That's why I couldn't put my camera on, because then you'd be like, oh my God, that's my sweater. And it would be very disconcerting for you. <laughs> I am. St- I'm looking at your face, though. Your picture is very nice. Oh, thank you. It's the only decent picture I've taken of myself in five years. <laughs> I think I remember the story about uh, that one. Yeah, I was nice and thin uh, because yeah. because the family I was staying with only drank water. <laughs> and now you're laughing at me because I said water wrong, right? No, that's okay. How, is it water? It's water. Is it really? That sounds very wrong to me. <laughs> I guess it's just your. Now people know I don't live where you live. When I say water, I feel like I'm mispronouncing a word, and everyone's looking at me. Like I, when I said it like that, I like the visceral feeling inside was, "Oh, Hannah's going to be like, oh, this idiot." Like, like that. How the, do you How do you say it again? Water. What water? Water. What? Okay. What water? All right. I know it's not right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not insane <laughs> well who knows i don't know if mine's right but yeah I say water. why don't i just start coming at this from a different perspective why are you saying water you lunatic <laughs> you mis- so you listen every day this is good everyone should listen every day what what, what is tell me about that. I, well i listen uh every time you post so i think it, that's four days a week it is or the a new one comes up you, uh, i start listening on the other days <sighs> i don't listen on the other days well, no. well okay let me just make a note about that doesn't support you. Okay, I got to keep going. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the, when I first started listening, I think I, I did listen every day. I would, I would maybe listen to like two or three a day because wow. I was just like taking it all in. I loved it. I like started at the beginning and then just had it roll on repeat. Uh, but then 
it got a little bit too much. So then I, now I just listen to the new, newest ones you post. Be honest. When you said it got to be a little bit too much, did you quietly look at yourself one day and go, yo, what are you doing? You've listened what? to a diabetes podcast three times a day for the last couple of months. Stop it. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. yeah. My yeah. quality of life is pretty low at that point. Right. Like, like your husband's like, hey, do you want to? And you're like, no, no, I don't have time for this. <laughs> I'm listening to a podcast that was recorded six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. Why were you so um, like uh, vigorous about it? I think when I started listening, I really resonated with uh, the way that you approach diabetes. And it was really impactful for me uh, in a lot of ways. So I just kept listening and listening. And was, I guess just surprised that I hadn't heard of it um, you know, before because I, I listened to quite a few podcasts. And I just kind of found it by chance just on my podcast player and it's like, Oh, I have diabetes. So I should probably listen to this. And um, I, I think just the way that you approach it, just through story. I, I, I love all the series that you have, mm -hmm. but then being able to listen to people's stories is really impactful. And there's always something to be gained from each episode um, about people's stories. Uh, and so that's why I like listening and it's just resonated with me. It's so kind of you to say that. And actually very helpful that you said that because my, direct access to people who listen to the show is only through Facebook mm -hmm. or social media. And those people are very much focused on management, which is terrific, but they don't tell me I really enjoyed listening to that conversation with this person. Yeah. I don't hear that from them as much. And so then I'm left to just, I have to steal up on my own and go, I know this is good. I know this is right. Like keep doing it. I always say that, I mean, today's a, um, a pretty cool day here, Hannah. I just crossed 10 million downloads um, wow. for, this, for the podcast. Uh, That's fantastic. Congrats. That's yeah. a huge milestone. Thank you. And I'll say this for people who then go, what? I stream it. Am I not helping? Downloads, streams, any way you listen is, account, is counted. So okay. thank you. Wow. Um, yeah. But Does it count even if someone listens to like 15 minutes of it and do doesn't finish? There are standards, uh, IAB standards that track how podcasts listens are counted. And the company that I use for my hosting is IAB compliant. So I don't, I don't know wow. the length of time that counts as a download, but mine are legitimate. They're not like, I don't do, there are things people do to push up their downloads so they can sell ads. Like they'll put out like a bunch of like four minute episodes so that, oh. you, you know what I mean? So like they could yep. have, they could have 10 listeners, but if they put out like five, four minute episodes, then they get five downloads from each listener who subscribe. Like I don't do that. I put out like right. my content's either quality or I don't do it. Right. Which is, I appreciate that. Thank you. And there are people who put their podcasts on web pages and put them on autoplay. So that when, oh, the, wow. when the page loads, the podcast starts to play, and then you go, wow. what the hell is this? And you click and stop it, but they get a download out of it or a stream. So, so you, But you know that yours are legit. I don't do any of that crap. These right. are people listening to the podcast. Yeah. So well, it, it's it's working and and keep it up. It's it's phenomenal. So it's really changed uh, in the last half a year, six months. It's really changed the way that I approach diabetes in a positive way and yeah, I just, I love it. Hannah, you've only been listening for six months? Mm hmm Wow. Oh, that's so cool. I, and you've had diabetes since you were 12 and you're 26? Well, yeah. So this will be, uh, this June will be 15 years. Wow. Wow, no kidding. Um, you're married, yes? I am married. I've married two and a half years. You and I have, have... Wait, do you have children? Uh, I do. I have an 18-month-old. Oh my God, Hannah, because I saw you for a minute when we first started talking and you don't, like you haven't lost the will to live yet. So I thought you didn't have kids. No, I, I love having a kid. <laughs> oh, we all love having kids, Hannah. That's not what I said. <laughs> I said, you don't have that stare on your face yet. <laughs> no, I, I slept great last night. You know, he slept through the night. So I'm well, well rested. He's with grandma right now. And, um, yeah. Well, congratulations. I, if only Thank you would have had the baby a little later, it could have been named Scott, but yeah, but no, and his name does start with an S, but it's not Scott. I'm sorry. Is there any way you would tell me that the S is for me? <laughs> no, no, thanks. Wow. <laughs>
<laughs> at least I know you won't lie during the conversation. Um, I, here's the here's the thing I could tell you about about having a kid that that's from my from my experience just last night. My day went really well yesterday. I worked a little too much. I got up. I edited. I did uh, an interview that went longer than I thought it was going to be. 90 or so minutes later, excuse me, two hours later, it might be the longest episode I've ever made. I had just talked about a very heady issue with a person and I was like drained. I came downstairs. I ate some food very quickly, said to my wife, I double booked myself today. I have to go back up and record again. That episode went an hour and a half. I got done, like literally got done, turned to, I have another computer next to me. I turned to my computer to look at my emails and... I noticed that I have a, like a warning on my phone about something and I look over at it and it's Arden is contacting me and she says, I need help. I, I have a flat tire ah. and I'm like, wait, okay. And so I start like your brain starts chugging through, like she has a flat tire. Is there a pump in the car? Let me see what to do. She's at school. Like, I don't know that town that well. And then she shows me on FaceTime. She doesn't have a flat tire. She, she, made a turn in an old town along a curb and sticking out from that curb was an old fashioned cast iron sewer and it had a sharp corner on it and she hit it with her back oh. wheel and it broke the wheel and ripped the tire open. Oh geez. And she's like, I was maybe going three miles an hour and she's, and she's like, I know I hit it, but like, she's such a good driver. She's like, I'm such a good, I'm like, I know it's okay. Like, don't worry about it. But, yeah. you know, we took care of the whole thing, and I talked her through it. My wife texted her. I was like, it's okay. We're fine. You're fine. Like, don't worry about it. And then it hit me later. This is what it is. Like, that idea that, like, everything can be okay, and then suddenly, for reasons that have nothing to do with any of the decisions that you have made in your life, something unavoidable happens. Yeah, sure. I, I hate that feeling. I, I really hated that feeling. I don't care about the tire, or the wheel, like we'll, we'll replace it. It's fine. But that feeling is, it, it, it numbs me inside a little bit. So anyway, look forward to that a number of times. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Um, anyway, uh, congratulations on the baby. Um, Thank you. Uh, you are, you found the podcast and you started listening. You said, I have diabetes. I should probably listen to this, but that's. Yes how was your, was it about management? Was it about meeting other people at type one? Like, what do you think really drew you in at first? U.S. Med always provides 90 days worth of supplies and they have fast and free shipping usmed.com forward slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. US Med accepts Medicare nationwide and over 800 private insurers. usmed.com forward slash juice box. Better service and better care is what US Med wants to provide for you. And they've provided that service for over 1 million diabetes customers since 1996. They carry everything from insulin pumps and diabetes testing supplies to the latest CGMs, like the Libre 3 and the Dexcom G7. But if you want the Libre 2 or the G6, they have that too. They also have Tandem, Omnipod Dash, Omnipod 5. They have so much. It's where Arden gets her diabetes supplies. We use US Med because, well, it's easy. And, you know, it's what we're all looking for. little less to think about usmed.com forward slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. The reorder process with US Med is, it's insanely easy. I get an email, I click on a link in the email, and it all just happens. A couple days later, stuff's at our door. If Arden's off at school, I can call or go through a link and just say, hey, you know what? Don't send it to the house, send it to college. And they just do that. It's wonderful. usmed.com forward slash juice box. We've been using US Med now for maybe two years, and I love it. It's easy, reliable, and Arden's supplies are always where they're supposed to be. USmed.com forward slash juice box.
I never open up the drawer and go, uh, where are the CGMs? Doesn't happen like that. It's all super easy. Check them out, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? That's not English. Just go take a look. USmed.com forward slash juice box. While you're looking at things, look down at your butt, at your derriere, your ass, that part back there. Doesn't it deserve to be comfortable? What about your legs and your arms and your torso and your neck? And let's not forget about your bits and pieces. These things are inside of your clothing. They're on your sheets and they're wrapped in your towels. What do you got? Some garbagey towels? They feel like sandpaper. Your sheets all like, ugh, ugh. You're touching them. You're like, it feels like this. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? Just dry and like, uh. You need cozy earth stuff. I'm not joking. Joggers, the shirts, the sweatshirts, the scrunchies, the sheets. Oh, the viscose bamboo is so soft and temperate. Not too hot, not too cold. I get out of the shower every day. I grab a waffle towel. I take the waffle side to get off all the water and then I flip it over to the fluffy side and I let that fluffy side work. I let it eat. You know what I mean? I'm just shine it up like an apple. Boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, I'm dry. I'm soft. Everything's great. And my day is on its way. Cozy Earth. Dot com. Use the offer code JUICEBOX to save, don't let this blow your mind, 40% off of your entire order. You go to CozyEarth.com right now. I'm there right now. Free shipping over $50 I'm seeing at the moment. Anyway, let me just like, let's imagine for a second, Scott wants more uh, bath towels. So I go to bath towels. I want to get some bath sheets. I like a nice, wide, long towel, right? Here they are. Already got a little sale happening. Maybe that sale will still be there when you get there. I don't know. Boom, I pop it in my cart, and then I put in the offer code juice box, and bada bing, 40% comes off the price. Go ahead, beat that with a stick. You can't, can you? No, go buy towels. Uh, I, I think just having diabetes and, and wanting to hear what you had to say on the podcast, at, at that time, my son was about a little under a year, uh, so I was still kind of uh, in the in the thick of like baby, uh, and it, newborn baby time. Yeah. And I, I did, I had really good management of my diabetes during pregnancy, but then after uh, I was pregnant or after I gave birth, I didn't take care of it as well as I did when I was pregnant. Obviously I was, it was kind of like, Oh, now I can relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. So then I was going from being pregnant, having really good management because I was eating low carb and and then last summer I found myself just like on the roller coaster and really discouraged and really frustrated that I couldn't like get my act together. And then when I started listening to you, there were so many things that you were saying with the way that you approach diabetes that resonated with me. And it, I don't know, it just motivated me to like make better decisions and just understanding the importance of a pre-bolus and finding the right basil and wow, figuring out how to use insulin for any kind of food. Cause I've tried every way of eating possible. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I have done that because I've learned how to give insulin for all of those kinds of ways of eating. And now I'm kind of just like, I'll just eat whatever. Yeah. Um, but like low carb, ketogenic, vegan, plant-based, Bernstein, gluten-free, like all of the, all these different kinds of ways of eating just to try to figure out what would work best. And then there was something you said in one of your podcasts that you were like, don't eat low, a low carbohydrate diet. If you don't know how to take insulin, <laughs> Like if that's your only reason to eat a low carbohydrate diet, don't, don't do that. Figure out how to use the insulin. And if you want to eat low carb, eat low carb, that's fine. But figure out, like you should know how to use the insulin for whatever. And that was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And, and so it just gave me that felt like this gave me this freedom to figure out how to use insulin with any kind of food that I want to eat. Am I... Am I hearing that you went through those different eating styles, hoping that you would land on one that just magically worked? Yeah, totally. Okay. Because the way that I was managing wasn't great. I wasn't very good at pre bolusing never have been until now. I am I'm now and never really figured out the right basil. I think it probably worked just fine, you know, and I've also gone back and forth between MDI and pumping. So I can, I can kind of do it with both. So even, do, so let me ask you prior to your pregnancy, did you get pregnant on purpose? Yes. You seem like a person who got pregnant on purpose, by the way. Does that mean anything to you? <laughs> that that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Like just seeing you in your room that you were in for five minutes, I was like, uh, she got pregnant on purpose. And I don't know why exactly. You just seemed like together. Does that make sense? 
Sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. Well, we did not get pregnant on purpose the first time. <laughs> My wife was homesick, and uh, it, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And yes. and she's much – here. here's something I've never said about Kelly. No one tell her I said this. She's so much nicer when she doesn't feel good. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, my God. She's so sweet and lovely when she's just a little sick. <laughs> if I had Munchausen's, this would be a perfect relationship. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because I could just like, anyway, point is, is that, yeah, so she was homesick. I guess she might have, like, anyway, then the baby came. And uh, you don't occur to me, like, as a person who would just be like, whatever, let's do it now. So um, prior to the baby, the decision Prior, uh, yeah, when, where was your management then? So when I got married, uh, it was just kind of all over the place. It, I, well, I guess just starting more at the beginning when I was 12 and diagnosed, I was at the age when I was kind of wanting to exercise independence. And so I, I took it on basically all on my own. Mm-hmm. Like first day in the hospital, I gave myself my first shot, no issues. And I was willing to learn, you know, what I needed to do. And my parents noticed really quickly that I kind of figured it out and was doing it. And so they kind of took a a little bit more of a backseat, which was totally fine. But because of that, I never developed the best habits for pre-bolusine and checking my blood sugar as consistently. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely took um, insulin when I ate, but I always just took it right when I sat down to eat. Uh, And then I would just check my blood sugar like before when I woke up and before bed. And so those were the habits that were just ingrained for like 10 years. Yeah. And so when I got my Dexcom probably about four years ago, I realized, oh, this, this isn't, this isn't working very well. Um, I didn't like seeing the huge uh, peaks and valleys, you know, from giving insulin as you're eating. And that was, it was discouraging for sure. I I didn't like seeing the highs and the lows and. Was was some of that just maturity, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, and then when we got married, I we knew we wanted to start a family soon-ish, you know, after we got married, maybe like six months after we got married. And so prior to that, I knew that uh, I wanted to, in my endo office, they have like guidelines for trying to conceive, you know, having an A1C under 6.5. Right. You know, having having good management, ideally being on a pump and... So that was kind of my goal. I was like, okay, I need to do that. I need to kind of get my act together. And then uh, I had tried a low carb diet in college and it worked decently well. So I went back to that because I knew that that was going to give me stable, more stable blood sugar. So for a few months before we got pregnant, I ate a low carb diet and was able to get my A1C under six. And so I felt good about that going into pregnancy and I kept that going, but I don't like eating a low carb diet. It's not fun. And it, it's just kind of, yeah, it just sucks. Um, I, I don't like it, but I did it during the pregnancy because I was terrified of having, you know, really high blood sugars all the time and, and potentially hurting the baby. So okay, so so you so you just kind of, I mean, not that I want to be clear. I don't think yeah. of eating a low carb diet as being restrictive. If if it's it's a decision, it's a it's a choice, right? Like I don't think if right. I, when I when I hear somebody's like you know, I enjoy a low carb diet. I'm like, Oh, they're, I don't think, Oh, they're stopping themselves from eating things. They, sh- I know they want to eat. Like, I don't think that, you know, um, but right. if, if you're doing that because of a management situation, you are stopping yourself from eating things you wanted to eat because you didn't know how to bolus for them. It, absolutely. Okay. That, and that was where I was. And that was the the struggle. And it, it just, when, when you restrict, I, I don't know all the psychology of it, but when, when you make decisions to restrict, it, it, it's like, it's kind of like the scarcity mindset where uh, it, it, it can make you think about the thing you're restricting more and make it really difficult to avoid. Uh, and so then after I had my son, I kind of just went crazy and I just ate all the carbs and just, you know, went crazy. And cause I had withheld it from myself, something that I wanted, I withheld it for so long. Um, and, and now, and then when I found your podcast, I was like, Oh, I feel this freedom to eat whatever I desire to eat and just figure out how to take insulin for it. And that concept was just like transformational for me. And now I'm at this point where I 
feel a lot more freedom about how I eat, which is, you know, which is huge. And it makes it a lot more sustainable um, because in, when you're restricting something, it's not a sustainable effort. It's like that white knuckling discipline that d- doesn't, it's not sustainable. So. No, I understand. And I appreciate you saying that. And I'm glad that it helped you. I'm disappointed. Yeah. I'm disappointed. You wouldn't lie and just say the kid's first initial was for me after all that. But I mean, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> Anna, um, you are lovely. Let me just say that. Let's let, you're still nervous you. though. Are you okay? I, I'm okay. I, I get nervous about these things. You know what I'm nervous about is listening to this whenever you post and listening to myself talk and then being like, oh gosh, that's what I said or that's what I sound like. Are you thinking about that while you're speaking? Yes, which is weird. Hannah, I don't know why I am. Hannah, let me let me tell you my secret. Try hard not to give a fuck what anybody thinks. <laughs> and then okay. you'll be okay. All right. Um you're just you're just sharing what you think. No one knows who you are. It's fine. Right. You know? Right. I'm the one at risk here. I'm about to edit an episode, Hannah. It'll be out a long time before this one comes out. But I'm about to edit an episode where a mom comes on to talk about her trans kids and mm. me trying to like, you know, me here who I don't to my knowledge don't know a trans person and mm-hmm. it's not a normal part of my day. And so I don't know. I don't know what I said. Like, I, I have to go back and edit. And I'm like, I can't, like, part of me is like, oh, I can't wait to go listen to that. But yeah. but, but I am more than a little concerned that I don't understand something right and that it would come off wrong to somebody, it, it, even though no, there'd be no ill intention behind it at all. Because I really, I, you know, I kind of feel the way of the world. I feel about the world the way I talked about the way people eat. Like, I don't, I honestly don't have a thought in the world about what people do. Like, I think it's cool like what works for you is great or what you are is great or whatever right yeah. but anyway that's which is the- a, yeah which is a really good approach and one of the reasons i like you because all the different approaches for example just approaches to eating uh the people that ascribe to those things they're they're like this is the only way and you have to be this way and and, Can and I- if you're if you don't do this you're wrong in, oh. in all this different kinds of ways that that's what i've noticed I'm like i don't like that i don't like that approach to life in general. And I don't like that approach to managing diabetes. I think everyone can have their own way and uh, figure out how it works best for them. I'm going to say, so, I'm going to say something, right? Okay. I, I think that's selling. So yes. I, I think that that's like, like, don't get me wrong. If you're just a person, like you're just a regular person, you're listening to this right now and you in your heart believe that eating a pescatarian diet is the only way to exist and you feel passionate enough about that to get online and say to people, you have to be a pescatarian. You have to be. You can't. If you don't, you're killing yourself. If you feel that way, like, God bless you. That, that's fine. I think when you hear people do it in social media, or um, which is where you're basically talking about, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, places like this, if you look hard enough, those people have a financial reason for saying what they're saying, or they are devotees of the person who has that thing. And to some degree, I noticed that with the people that listen to the podcast, like they'll, they will go online and say to somebody, this podcast is what you should do. You should listen to this podcast because, it, right. because it's so, it's so helped them. Mm-hmm. They're, they're so passionate about it that when someone says, oh gosh, my A1C is nine and I don't know what to do, or look at this there's this big spike and I don't know how that happened. A person who's heard the podcast and now understands how to use insulin and feels the way that you've described, you know, for the last 20 minutes, they come in there with a ton of passion and say, Oh, the juice box podcast, blah, blah, blah. People from the outside look at that and go, Oh, look at this proselytizing about this podcast. Right. It's the same thing with eating styles. Yes. You know, now the difference is, is that I don't run around telling people, you have to listen to this podcast and you can't listen to anything else because if you do, that's wrong and this is right. I don't say that. I don't feel that. Right. And that's what I I think is so attractive about the way that you do this and why so many people listen and are on the Facebook group. And yeah, Yeah. so that's just a, that's a beautiful approach. Yeah. Do you know, do you know what I think people, I believe my opinion, why people do that? I think that's fear. I think they feel like they have a thing and if they don't feed it and grow it, that it will wither and die. And so every person who, 
it doesn't matter, right? If we're talking about eating, then if I'm out there pushing a, a high plant diet and you're out there eating keto, some people have the feeling like, well, I lost one, I'm losing. And I don't right. feel like that. I genuinely, right. I genuinely believe that whatever works for you is the thing. And if that means a different website, a different Facebook group, if you want to find a different podcast that helps you or whatever, and it's not me, that has to be okay. Of course. Right. I can't feel like, oh, well, well, you, you know, Hannah wants to go eat this way, so she's not going to listen to the podcast anymore. I have to feel like that's good. Like if, if Hannah's okay, then that's good. Now, where my competitive nature comes in, when you hear pe- you hear me say like, I want to win, like I do want I do want everybody to listen to the podcast, but but that's because yeah. I believe that anything they may need is in here. And when I find something that's not, I try to add it. I don't know. I find that to be a different perspective. At, and, you know, I don't know if everybody would understand that, but I do my yeah. best to keep this place very inclusive about all ideas and thoughts. I don't, even on the Facebook page, like, I, I got a note the other day. It's like, you can't let a person say that. And I was like, Phew. I'm not going to stop them. I was like, like, they're an adult and all. Like, why would I stop them from saying what they want to say? Why would you want to? Right. And then when you pick through it, the reason they wanted to stop them is because they were afraid of what they were saying. It's always fear. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. anyway, thank you. I'm glad glad you like it. And I appreciate that you're here. Thank you. One funny thing, when I first started listening and you started talking about being bold with insulin, I was like, okay, what does that mean? And I for three days thought that it was an acronym and I was trying to figure out what the acronym B O L D stood for. And I was like, it's, it's, he's not saying what this means. I was like, okay, the B is probably basal or bolus. The O is probably Omnipod because his daughter uses Omnipod and that's a sponsor. And the L I couldn't figure out the L and then the D was probably Dexcom or something. Oh my God. I thought so hard about this. I was like, what does this mean? I and love I, that. <laughs> I love that you did that. <laughs> So I went back to the original. I was like, okay, where's the first podcast where he talks about bold with insulin? Because surely he says what the acronym is. Mm -hmm. And then I quickly realized, oh, this literally means just being bold with your insulin and (laughs) making appropriate changes. (laughs) It was hard for me not to laugh while you were telling the story because I, I mean, you, you listen to a lot of the show. So you know that I don't really name the episodes with a lot of, yeah, like specificity. How impressed are you that I said specificity correct? Because I found myself going way not to trip up on that word. But I just, I was talking, it's episode 11. And I was telling a story. It was back, it's back before I even had, like, I didn't have guests that frequently. I was still going through the blog posts that I had written in the years prior that I knew were really helpful for people. And I was kind of trying to contextualize them in these shorter podcast episodes. And I I'm talking to myself. If you really listen to it, you hear me talking myself through what I did back then. Like, I'm trying to remember it for you. And then I, I think I said, like, I guess I, I learned to be more bold with insulin. And mm-hmm. then when I went back and edited that, that, that recording, those words stuck out to me and I made it the title of the episode. It's, right. not, it's not an actual thing. Right. It's just an idea that you have. Well, and then what happened was is that a couple of years later, I I saw it hashtagged in places, and oh, it, wow. and I and I don't normally think, oh, that must have been me, but I thought I've never heard anyone say that but me. Like I'm gonna go like pick around, and as I picked around, I realized that somebody had listened to the podcast and they they had taken like picked it up as a mantle. I'm going to be bold with insulin, so <laughs> it's a function of the listeners, not me that that term is in the zeitgeist now. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, and I, I love that it tortured you for a number of days. Did you ask your husband? Were you like, what do you think the O stands for? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it was just my, the musings in my brain, just thinking, huh, I wonder what this is. But I don't know why my immediate thought was, this has to be an acronym. Yeah, I don't either, but that's fantastic. What we, yeah. we, I don't even know, like, if I tried, like, if I could come up with one. I don't think I could. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> be on I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I get I get lost at L every time. So Well, wouldn't it be funny if it was be on low diet <laughs> or low carb go. diet? <laughs> oh gosh. Uh but no. but anyhow, like uh but that's see see I think that's 
it's a completely telling because it took you as well. Like, like you saw it and you're like, bold, what could that mean? What, like, what is that? Like, and all I meant by it was that I was being timid with insulin. Yes. That's all. I was scared of it and I wasn't using as much of it as Arden needed. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that helped you. No kidding. Cool. This is great. All right. So baby comes out and you do the thing where your your life is shifting huge. By the way, the thing, it's the parenting thing. Yes. The first thing you do is give away your own health or happiness. That's how it works when you're divvying up the pie. (laughs) You look at the pie and you go, baby. By the way, the pie after you have your first baby is baby 98.5%, husband 0.5%, me 1%. (laughs) Yes. I, I, I think I said in a book I wrote, that when my son was born, I became my my uh, my son and wife's major domo. <laughs> they were just, she was like, "Hey, how can you possibly service the baby and I properly?" Yes, and I'd be like, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> "What about me?" And she's like, "There's no you. You don't exist anymore." And I was like, "Oh, okay." So, so, but you gave away your own care. But I don't think, if I'm guessing, it isn't just because you were like, "Fifth, I don't care about myself." It was because the way you got through the nine months wasn't purposeful. Right. It was forced. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 like, I didn't know how to give insulin for the way that I typically would eat. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was just all over the place and that was pretty discouraging, but um, been able to figure out. Oh, and and one, another reason why I love your podcast is because there's not, it's not like you listen to these five episodes and then all of a sudden you have the tools that you need to now make the changes in your life. Like diabetes is a long game. It's a, it's a throughout your whole life. You're going to be always learning. Mm -hmm. And even just the the way the podcast is with over 800 episodes and that they're long episodes that, that kind of, you know, know, we're not even talking about diabetes the whole time, but just the story in your conversations and the fact that it's just long kind of just shows that that's how diabetes is. That's how you learn through it. And it's a, it's a daily thing. And I think before I found your podcast, I was just so focused on, oh my gosh, today I, my blood sugar's high. And I was so, yeah, just focused on the the here and now and discouraged. And I didn't know how to just take that and learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. You have that, that very like micro view. <laughs> yes. It was very, yeah. it was a very like micromanaging trying to figure out. So then if my blood sugar was good, then I was feeling good. And I was like, this is fine. I, you know, but then if I was having a, uh, a roller coaster day, or if my blood sugar was high and I didn't understand it, I would just get discouraged and be like, this stinks. And definitely have experienced a lot of diabetes burnout, which you said, uh, I, I think it was a guest, maybe a uh, therapist you had on, she said, diabetes burnout is when you're trying really hard and you're not getting the results because which it was totally what I was in for a long time, especially in college. Mm-hmm. I was trying really hard, but I wasn't trying the right things. So I was trying really hard, but it wasn't working because it wasn't, I didn't have the correct tools or the correct information on how to, how to, maybe I didn't have the right basil and I didn't know how to test for it, or I didn't, I wasn't taking enough insulin or, or whatever it was, Yeah, it's, you, you know, like you're, you're trying really hard and you're not getting the results. And then it's just daily frustration. Struggling. Yeah. Frustration. Yep. Yeah. And then the frustration turns into, well, why am I doing this? It's not working. Right. Yeah. And then you, then people stop trying and then we term that burnout, but the burnout happens before you stop trying. And yeah, I, I, I made a note here to myself cause you said something I want to bring up later, but um, before I get back to that, uh, what the hell? God damn it. <sighs> Hannah, I'm getting old. Thought just flew right out of my head. It's not your fault. Um, you were just talking about all that, about the burnout and, oh, learning. I got it. I don't think that people learn the way most people try to teach, right? Like, Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. We're stuck in that mindset of... Uh, We'll all sit down. I will tell you a list of facts. You will retain those facts. And then I will sit down again and tell you how to use the facts. And then you will practice using the facts. And now you have learned. And I, and I think that's, you know, based on probably how we grow up in, in, in school, right? Like, you know, here's a bunch of facts, then we'll test you on them. I was a monumentally bad student. 
I've I, heard you mention this. I, I, I yeah. know this. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm, I would, if you looked at me in school, you'd be like, oh, that boy must have bumped his head on something. You, you know, like I, I look confused. I'm failing. Like uh, if I could get a D in something, I'd be like, right on. This is amazing. I'm going to pass. And, and that, that was most of, that was most of my time in school. I was better at social studies. Social studies was storytelling. Yeah. Right. right? And I was bad at science. Science was facts and and remember the facts and then put them in the right place. I'm bad at math. Math is facts and the right place. If you could put a, a projector on my brain and watch me figure out math, you'd be like, why is it happening like that? <laughs> but but I come out with the answer. Um, right. I'm literally telling myself a story about the numbers and how the numbers work. And yes. so to me... The biggest mistake being made in patient care is that we're trying to tell people, these are the facts. These are how the facts work. Go do it. In, right. Instead of, think of all the things that you know. And I'm not even just talking to you now, Han. I'm talking to everybody. All the things that you know, the information that's in your head. You hear people say all the time, like, I don't know why I know that. Like, why do I know Bruce Springsteen, 73? Like, you know, like I know that. Hannah, because the person I interviewed yesterday brought up Bruce Springsteen and I said, oh, Bruce Springsteen, 73. I don't even like Bruce Springsteen. Why do I know Bruce Springsteen, 73? I heard an interview with him and he mentioned he was 73 and it stuck in my head. I don't know why. And I think that most of us know most of what we know in that same fashion. And so the podcast is set up like this. So that if you listen to an episode, hopefully you're entertained, but you're not going to shut it off and go, oh, that episode was about this and this and this. And I'll, I'll never forget that. It'll just be three weeks from now, like something will happen with your diabetes and you'll be like, oh, you know, I'm probably just going to do a temp basal increase here. And you're not even going to know why you're doing it. And that's, right. that to me is why it works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another thing that, that, that idea is shown is. Uh, the idea of um, carb counting, I, whenever I, I learned how to do that when I was diagnosed and I, I hated it. And I'm the, I'm like you, where I look at a plate of food and I say, oh, that's six units of insulin. Mm -hmm. I don't, I have absolutely no clue of the carb count because I, I don't like, I, I would last a day if I had to sit and calculate all my carbohydrates, but I know based off you know, the type of food it is, my exercise level, my, my hormones, my sleep, all these other factors that I'm not consciously thinking about, but it's intuitive that I know, okay, I need six units of insulin or whatever the number is, or I need a higher basal or I need a lower basal or, or whatever. And that's, that idea is how I've always done diabetes, but I always felt like I was doing it wrong because they don't do that at the endocrinologist's office. Yeah. And I was like, I was always fighting the way that I was quote unquote supposed to do it based on their terms. But I was like, well, the way I'm doing it is working better. And so then hearing you on the podcast, like, Oh, okay, this is okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is okay. I can, I can figure this out on my own because I just wanted to do the right thing. And I wanted to follow the rules with what, what I learned at the office, but it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, Hannah, I'm bad at, I don't know where to put commas in sentences sometimes. Sure. Yeah, but I'm a published author. <laughs> yeah, you have a book. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, I mean, a publisher paid me to write a book. Like, right. everybody writes stuff and self-publishes it now, and if that's good for you, that's fine. But you're not a published author. You publish yourself. I'm a published author. A publisher came after me and said, hey, you write down your thoughts. We'll put it in a book and sell it to people. And I don't know where commas go. But that didn't stop me when they made me the offer. I was like, right on, I could do that. And I thought I can tell a story. Absolutely. I'll figure out where the I'll figure out where the commas go later. And it just made me think of that with you in the in the the office because you're like, I know how to do this. Why are you telling me I'm wrong or that I shouldn't or that I can't just because I don't know where the commas go? Like that's right. like, I don't have to do it your way to do it. And I mean, I think that. I think society is proving that out in a big way. There's been a lot of interesting little shifts. Like, here's one of them. Apostrophe S. Have you noticed that people have stopped using it willfully? I haven't noticed. They know it belongs there and they don't care. <laughs> and they're like, I'm not doing this anymore. 
and it's taking over. Yeah. And and it's moving towards functionality over, you know, what I guess, quote unquote, is supposed to be. And so I, I don't know if that's right or not. It might be infuriating to some people. I just think oh, it's I'm in, sure. <laughs> I just think it's interesting that that the that people can move in that direction. I know we're all worried about this generation, but if we can get them out of their house and get them around other people, they're going to be really good. Like like they they they're not held back by what everyone says is supposed to happen. And I don't I think about diabetes management that way. Like yeah. I, I honestly, I don't care what anyone says because I think they're only saying it because the person before them said it. And, you know, yeah. and I, I, I think I've told the meatloaf story in my book. I've told it in this podcast. I don't know where it originated from, but to me, it says everything you need to know about the way you're supposed to do things. And yeah. you'd be surprised how much of what you think you're supposed to be doing is based on nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So count your carbs. And if you don't do it right, that's bullshit. Like, like I can count carbs perfectly. And if I'm not accounting for fat and something, it's not going to matter. Right. You know, and then you have that person thinking, well, I counted the carbs perfectly. Now that this didn't work, well, this is an anomaly. So that's just diabetes. So there's nothing I can yeah. do about that. So this is now what I'm going to live with. And they don't right. even realize, like, no, it's just, you know, there's a certain amount of fat in the French fries you just ate. And about 60 or 90 minutes after you eat the fries, you're going to get a spike because your digestion slows down. And there's actually a formula you can come up with to take the fat and translate it into insulin and stop that from happening. Like, wouldn't mm -hmm. that be better to know? Right. You know? And then or, at least... Go ahead. Or you just had a... A big hike and you need way less insulin for that meal. So if you do your typical carb ratio, you're going to plummet or, or whatever it is, you have to think about all the variables and what's going on in your day. That's so that your carb ratio is going to be changing all the time. And so I don't, I just don't use carb ratios really. I just know how much insulin I need. Are and you? that's just, it's through years and years of uh, personal experience and um, being thoughtful about what my blood sugar is doing based off of the circumstances. Yeah. But people also need a um, a pat on the ass, a shove. You know what I mean? I don't think we're allowed to tap people on the butt anymore to say good job. But anyway, like a shove. I didn't want to say shove. But, but you need somebody behind you bracing you and saying, you're doing the right thing. Keep going. Or, you know, if this is working for you, don't doubt it. Because a lot of people, I I'm going to say many people, don't have whatever the thing is I have where I hear something and I go, I don't care what people think. It's fine. You, you yeah. know, like, like we're, we're just going to keep moving. I don't take into it. And by the way, even that's a misnomer. I care what people think. I just don't, I'm just not stopped by people's opinions. And yeah. so, but a lot of people are, and it sounds like you, you might've been as well, which makes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent, which makes sense. Cause you planned the baby. And anyway, I don't have time to go into your whole psychology, but I understand you, Hannah. And yeah. um, and by the way, just by how you had things hung on your wall behind you, <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> but 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 that that is a gift you need to give to people. You need yeah. to be able to tell them to trust their gut. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't have that before the podcast really because, uh, and I don't I don't think anyone should do this, but I I quit seeing my endo halfway through my pregnancy because they were so against me eating a low carb diet. Every time I went, they told me I was going to damage my baby, which I couldn't bear hearing, but my blood sugar was awesome. And so I just stopped going because I knew that what I was doing was better for my health and for my baby. And so the podcast is something that gives me the confidence to say, okay, yeah, you can make these decisions and you are the master of your own diabetes mm -hmm. health. And so I, I think I'm at a place now with, with if, when we get pregnant again, that I'll be able to go to the off like the endos and say, okay, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. You know, can, can you support me in this instead of just feeling yeah like I didn't know how to advocate for myself right. before uh, back then I was just, just discouraged. So I just stopped going. Were you so then the whole, I cut you off. I, I, I cut you off. I didn't mean to, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So the whole, later part of my pregnancy, I was just on my own. 
Mm. When when the doctor said low carb is going to hurt the baby, I first of all, I I have no like I'm not a nutritionist. I don't know if that's true or false or something. I don't know between, either. <laughs> right. But did they know that you were doing it because you didn't know another way to keep your blood sugar stable? No, I don't think they understood that because I I didn't really go to them frequently beforehand, uh, maybe once or twice a year. And, and then, well, and they had a, a diabetes specific doctor um, I, I, who I think is really great and knowledgeable and she works with type one diabetic pregnancies. That's her whole thing. And so she knows how to do it, but they didn't really know me. And the, the first time I went in the office, there was no congratulations or, you know, we're excited for you. It was like, here's the risks here. And uh, here's what you need to do. You have to keep your blood sugars in this range. This is what is expected. And, and or, or you really could hurt your baby. And, and so it was just really like scary. Mm. And so the way they approached that wasn't very helpful. And I was telling them I was eating, I wasn't eating that the amount of carbohydrates they wanted me to eat and that that was going to delay my, the baby's brain development or whatever, which didn't end up, end up happening. He was perfect. But so there was just no, it was like we were fighting against each other. There was no, it, I just didn't feel supported. So I just stopped going. There's no harmony at all. Yeah. And I, and I, and I didn't feel the freedom to share my story and right. they didn't know really who I was or, or whatnot, but I'm hopeful that um, going forward I can, because I do want that support and being able to have a professional to talk to. And yeah, it would be, it would be amazing. It, you know, what's interesting is that in your scenario, the doctor is the doctor starts off their life with their own thoughts and then their thoughts are fed by their parents and then by their teachers and where they go to college. And, and then after that, they're pretty set in how they think about things. Now they see other people's experiences, but because they're in the risk aversion game, they're they're probably seeing things from the what can go wrong perspective more more often than not. And absolutely. And they're they're not blending you into that conversation at all, like who you are. Whereas you know, and this is unfair to them, but the po- like making a podcast and talking to so many people, like this the voice of this podcast, it started out as mine, but now it's and it started out the same way. These were my experiences and everything. But now it's it's blended with everybody who's ever been on. Because right. n- not only do I grow with their conversations um, and my responses grow with, with having had their these conversations, but their stories are, are right here too. So, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, like it's not that a doctor could accomplish that maybe, but that's what you need. You need... You need a big picture beyond what you can imagine. And it, it has to be, it's a lot of feelings mixed up with words and intentions <laughs> and, you know, the intention of your words and the tone that they come with. I speak differently now than I did before. Like I used to mm-hmm. have, when I first started making the podcast, if you, if a person like you talk a little slow for me, it's not a big deal, oh, No, no, but you're a little more measured when you're speaking and when there's a moment when I know how you're going to finish your sentence and in the past I would have been compelled to say it out loud. And now yeah. there's a voice in my head that says someone's going to, someone is going to hear her, like really hmm. hear her right now. And I need to let her finish that thought. It's not just about her and I having this conversation. It's about the people listening to it as well. So yeah. there's tone in your voice and intent and sometimes sadness that comes from people and other people learn from that when they hear it. They don't know it's happening. They don't learn from it like two plus two is four and take the test. They they learn by hearing it over and over again. You, you're not going to get that from a doctor's visit, not just around diabetes, obviously, but in anything. Right. Because yeah. you need that experience in the and, and people's support and people's stories. Uh, we, and, and, you, and you don't. And you don't want the pilot pontificating about their feelings while the plane's crashing into a mountain. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I, you do want the pilot to go, Oh, here's what I learned. Let me get this thing out of the way. And, and that's, but the doctors miss out on, like, if you could find that OB right now and tell them, I came to you pregnant and you didn't go, congratulations. You just said, here's all the things that could go wrong. I bet you if, if you told that person outside of their practice, sitting, having a cup of coffee with them, they'd be mortified that they did that. Yeah. 
you know, but that doesn't help you because that was not because now that's your experience. Right. You know, and I'm probably going to see that same doctor for my next pregnancy because she is the only one at the office that I go to that is she, she does all the pregnancies. So that's what she does. So I don't know how I'll approach that. I may share my experience and, and see if we can do it different. Uh, we'll just kind of have to see how that goes at that time. But I, I think, and I hope that it will be a, a better experience together and that there can be more of a relationship to be had through that. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know if you care, but I'd walk in and say, hi, before we get started, I need to share with you that in my last pregnancy, uh, our first meeting was all about fear and I didn't feel any of the joy that I thought I would feel coming to the OB. It's not your fault. I don't think you did it on purpose, but I don't want this this new relationship we're about to have to get off on that same foot. Please like, do your best to treat me like everyone else because I, I think you saw diabetes walk into the room and not Hannah the last time. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah, by then the way, they won't like that. And you'll probably get fired. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that I can do that. It would be uncomfortable for me, but it would be the uh, the best approach. Yeah. I mean, it's the only way because otherwise, like all of her, her, am I, is it a he, her? Sorry. Her. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yesterday I made, I was, I don't know if people understand, like, I don't think doctors are just men or women. <laughs> I just, I just, I pick a, I know I pick a pronoun and I go with it while I'm telling the story. And yesterday I, I did it on an interview and I stopped and I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, was it a man? And the person goes, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> then I just felt like I just did it again, but she's going to, she's just going to revert to what she does. Right. You know what I mean? Maybe you'll get a little more, Hey, because your baby came out. Okay. Or right. because you left, I mean, you left, in the middle a little bit, right? Um, yep. Maybe she'll be like, oh, it's you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your baby okay? Yes. <laughs> I'll, prob I'll probably bring him. You're like, yeah, here he is. Yeah. Here he is. Look. Look, his eyes are on his head and everything. He doesn't have a tail. Turn him around. Be like, look, no tail. <laughs> oh. I, I did think to ask you that when you're like, I left. I, I was like, is the kid okay? <laughs> <laughs> like he did, like, he didn't come out with like a foot coming out of the side of his head or something, right? You know, so um, but but uh, no, I mean, listen, that it's tough. Like, I mean, there's part of me that thinks that maybe you do a, maybe you have a a meeting with her prior, even, and say, hey, look, I'm thinking of getting pregnant again. I'd really like to come back here. You know, here's here, here's what I was hoping we could do. I don't know. Right. Like, it's all about them, and trust me, it's a lot about ego. Yeah. Like if their ego can handle it, you'll be okay. But if, if she can't let that go, might be, might be unpleasant. All I can tell you is that the OB that handled my first child's birth was so devoid of personal anything. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> it's like talking to a robot that was going to catch your baby. Um, yeah. uh, but he didn't know what he was doing. Kid came out. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Who knows? But we weren't dealing with diabetes while we were doing it. Right. What is your story? Like, how how have you been personally with diabetes? Because your notes are very sparse, but they mention some struggles a little bit. Yeah. For So the first 10 years, so from 12 to 22, I was kind of just coasting and doing the same thing. I had a Medtronic pump and I gave insulin right before I ate. And I checked my blood sugar maybe twice a day, but I was living with unknown shame about diabetes. When I was diagnosed for some reason, because of maybe my age, where I was developmentally, my personality, I was immediately filled with shame when I was diagnosed. When they told me you have diabetes, that was the overwhelming feeling, but I wouldn't have said that then. I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. It honestly wasn't until 12, 10 years later that that really started to come out in ways that were really unpleasant. So in college, you know, 22, pretty severe anxiety and depression, all, all surrounding diabetes, but I didn't know it and disordered eating and 
diabetes distress and denial about it and just confusion. I, I wish someone would have told me or my parents when I was diagnosed that it was going to impact mental and emotional health. And maybe they do that now. I hope they do. I hope they share that. But I needed counseling and I needed therapy to really work past all of that. Mm-hmm. And so like, I would encourage like anyone who has diabetes, if you haven't had counseling or therapy for it, do it because it was so helpful for me. And my counselor, she didn't know, understand diabetes at all, but she understood trauma, which she, she told me that a, a diagnosis like that at 12 is a traumatic experience Yeah, because you, you understand, oh, this is a, well, you're losing a part of yourself. Part of your body is not working um, and it's going to affect the rest of your life. And so, so we unpacked all of that and we, we worked through it. And I did EMDR therapy, which I know it's been mentioned on the podcast before. And that was so helpful because uh, before doing that, every single time my blood sugar was high, it, I was filled with shame and panic. And so I would, I just wouldn't check my blood sugar mm-hmm. because I, I couldn't handle that emotional. It was so uncomfortable, but being able to work through, being able to work through that with uh, a counselor and doing therapy was, was really, was really helpful and, and just gave, gave me more freedom to actually take care of myself in an impactful way because shame is a, it's a really powerful emotion, but it's never correct. Like shame says that you are a bad person. Like it's an identity. It's like, I'm bad. And that was what I felt every time my blood sugar wasn't quote unquote in range. And and that's a lot to handle, especially, you know, as a, as a middle school or into high school and, and just being able to go through a grief process. Like I think anyone with diabetes will have to go through a grief process, which is whatever the five, however many stages there are. I know there's denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there's uh, eventually you get to acceptance. Um, And that took a long time for me. Like I was probably in that denial stage for 10 years and what that looked like for some people that maybe looks like not managing at all, which is really dangerous for me. It just looked like keeping it kind of hidden to myself and taking insulin. So I didn't end up in the hospital, but I was never told when I was diagnosed, Oh, you're going to probably have to work through this, or there's going to be some mental impact here, or there's emotional impact here. Yeah. It's interesting too, that, that most people don't exhibit enough signs so that people around them could think, Oh, there's something wrong or this. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You, 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 I don't even know if you're hiding it as much as it's just, you're trying to function. So, yeah. And I was excelling. I was excelling in school. I was a three sport athlete. I was, you know, doing great by everyone's standards, but beneath the surface, there was a lot of struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think that all the time when people are telling their stories and you know that they're surrounded by people who would have done something had they known. Uh, I mean, sometimes there are people who are surrounded by people who know and don't help and that's a different problem, but, but it's just a, I mean, it's just terrible that, that that could be so true for you and that yet it, it, you're so far away from the answer when the answer was really what just seeing a therapist and, and working through it. You know. Yeah. As we were working through, you know, my depression and anxiety and different just struggles I was having, it kept coming back to diabetes. And at first I was like, no, this is, this doesn't have to do with diabetes. This is, that's different. That's a, a separate thing, but it kept coming back to that. And eventually I just realized, oh yeah, most of this is, was surrounding my diagnosis and how that affected me at that time and that age. Mm, yeah. And it's just shock- it's just I shocking. remember we, what's that? Is it just shocking to be diagnosed, right? It, oh yeah. A total shock. Yeah. And my, and I, I didn't know how to handle it. And there's no pause. It's not like, it's not like someone says to you, Hey, you have diabetes. And over the next number of days, weeks, and months, we are going to thoughtfully go through what all that means. It's, it's like you're at the doctor or the hospital and then suddenly everything about your life changes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like having a car accident. Yeah, it's a, it, it is a traumatic experience. Mm. And trauma, I think a lot of people experience trauma in their life in small ways. It, it may be a, a big thing, a different, different kinds of trauma. But a, a diagnosis like that is there should be mental health support and emotional support 
for any diagnosis like that. And I, I, I don't think it's widely understood. Um, but also like my therapist, she didn't, she didn't have diabetes. She didn't understand what it was. I just kind of told her about it. So you don't have to find someone who's a diabetic counselor. Yeah. You know, you just find someone who's a counselor and is good and can help you. Yeah, understands um, how people's emotions are, are hurt and yeah. how they can be brought back. Yeah. yeah. And so it dramatically, in two ways, it dramatically impacted my management in a positive way because one, I wasn't having panic attacks. So then I wasn't experiencing that, you know, increase in adrenaline and cortisol and that spikes my blood sugar. So it, from a, uh, a physiological standpoint, it was helping, but then also it, it helped me to, uh, it took away the burden of making the daily decisions to pre bolus and make corrections and, and mm-hmm. change my insulin. So it was kind of the two, two ways that it really helped me be able to manage better day to day. Well, no, that's terrific. I mean, it's just anything that works, obviously, but right. therapy gets a bad rap from some people. And so I don't think they think to try it. I think they think it's um, an admission of something. Again, more shame, really. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, for sure. Um, and I, and I, for me, it wasn't until I decided that I needed help and was going to reach out that it was helpful because I had tried, you know, previously because I was encouraged to by other people and, but I wasn't ready. So it has to be when the person is ready and they, they seek it out and they admit, okay, yeah, this is time. This is where I am. And I want to get help is when, when you actually get help that changes. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, and shame looks like different things to different people, right? Like you could feel excluded. You could have, uh, like exposure that you don't want, you know, somebody looking at you, um, sure. ex- expectation. Yeah, I was always embarrassed about it. Like I, I never wanted to tell my friends that I had diabetes. I don't know why it was embarrassing. It just was. Cause I also associated diabetes with like an old fat grandma. Like that wasn't me. Why do I have diabetes? Cause I, I didn't understand type one and type two and the yeah. difference. No, you know, like why did I get like an old person's disease? Yeah. Why did I get old? I'm 12. And why, right. did, why, why do I have a, a grandma's disease. Cause that's every, what everyone would say. Like my, I would tell my friends, I would just say, tell it to a few people and be like, Oh, my grandma has that. And I'm like, yeah, cool. <laughs> Great. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's, it, it, if you felt that way, then at least a sliver of the people you're going to bump into are going to have that same thought. Now you're aware of that. And, right. you know, so everybody you approach, you you kind of subconsciously believe like some of these people are judging me now and then you get that that's that unwanted exposure which can feel like shame um you can also your expectations are have been let down that's a a feeling that 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 shame thrives inside of as well yeah yeah it's terrible there's been episodes about shame i should do more honestly Uh, but earlier you mentioned the word scarcity oh did that come from your therapy Oh, I have no clue. Okay. I don't know. So I don't remember what I said that in, in regards to. Yeah. So there's, um, you said scarcity mindset. Yeah. And it just struck me because like three days ago, somebody said that to me. Oh. In, in the oddest yeah. place. I was getting my teeth cleaned. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're, does everyone's dentist come in and do a checkup while the person in the middle of the teeth cleaning? I, I for sure. Okay. That's what mine does. Right. <laughs> And so do you have a chatty dentist? Like one that actually cares to talk to you? Yeah. Mine is very chatty. It's very difficult. He's what? It's very, it's hard because my mouth's open and there's fingers in my mouth and and he's talking. Oh, oh, I see. You were like, I thought you said he's very chatty. He's difficult. And I was like, you were like, it's difficult because they're, they want to talk to you while your money with your mouth. open. Um, So my, my, my guy is a really thoughtful person and, you know, does talk to you about your health before he checks you. And um, he, he asks you about your whole life. And he hmm. asked me about the podcast. I've been going there for a very long time. And you have to try to imagine that I am who I am always. Like, I, yeah. like I, you know, like I walked into the dentist's office that day and I had a question and I just walked in and there's like three people working there and I know all these people. And I'm like, uh, hey, I got to ask you a question. Is there anybody else in here? like any other patients and I can see down the hallway to the doctor who I've known personally as well. And 
he, he, I said, can I ask my question? He looks at me across the distance and just starts shaking his head back and forth. Like, no, 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 no. Meaning there's someone in here and I can't be sure of what you're about to say. <laughs> so please. Oh my not. gosh. But all I really wanted to ask, not that this matters, but I, it was a very early appointment. I walked in, I was like, God, you guys get up this early every day. <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> and so they're like, yeah, we come to work every day at this time. And I was like, that's, I said, you should get a different job. This is not good. And um, they're, they're like, well, we can't all make a podcast. I was like, hey, 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 I worked for an hour and a half today. <laughs> and I was like, and I'm going to go do more. Don't, don't. But, I, you know, so anyway, I, joking around a little bit, he comes in later to clean my, t- to help with the teeth cleaning. And I said, I got to thank you. I've never felt so seen in my entire life. <laughs> Oh I was like, you knew not to let me speak out loud if there was another person in here. And we laughed a little bit. And he said, oh, I've just, and he, and he starts to mention like, you know, I've known you for so long. And he's like, your, your life has been like, like quite a transformation, like, you know, about the things you've accomplished and done. And, you know, and he was talking about it and it led him to say, how's the podcast going? And I told him that it was about to hit 10 million downloads. Mm. And that, you know, and he's like, oh, he's congratulating me and everything. I said, but I just, like, I get up every day just thinking about how to make it keep going. Like, how to keep it going and how to grow it. And I said, the keep it going part and the grow it part are the same because once you see it helps somebody. Like, kind of like, once I hear your story, I think, well, I can't stop making this podcast because there's going to be another Hannah, right? And right. And... At the same time, there's not just another Hannah. There's a thousand other Hannahs. So if I could grow it, I could reach more of them. And maybe more people would have the happy outcome that you've had. And I and yeah. I said, so that's kind of how I think about it. And I'm always worried it's going to stop. And he's mm. and he's like, what? And I was like, it's, I'm like, dude, it's, it's media. Like, they're going to get sick of it eventually. If I don't, if I don't keep morphing it. And letting it grow, but not too quickly. Like the the podcast can't just make some like monumental shift. It has to slowly morph is the right word from like, like as it grows and gets different, but not too different so that the people who like it don't go, oh God, this thing changed. I'm, I'm dropping it now. Like it's a hard thing to do to keep, to gather people in one place and keep them interested in a way that they're like, I want to go find that podcast today. I'm going to go, I'm going to go learn about whatever this episode's about. And yeah. he said, Oh, that's a scarcity mindset. Don't think that way. Mm. And I was like, um, is it like, I don't think it is. <laughs> I think, I think it, I'm being realistic, but, but he was so worried for me. He's like, please don't think that way. He's like, let that go. And things will just flourish. And I'm like, I don't know, man, 10 million, like, it's flourishing, isn't it? You, you, you know? So anyway, we had this long conversation while I was sitting in a weird angle. And he was like looking over at me with a bright light in my face. <laughs> Do, is it not a thing that you think about? You just kind of said it in passing? I think I just said it in passing. I think I, I've definitely heard the concept of a scarcity mindset versus a, an abundance mindset. But yeah, I'm trying to figure out if that's if what he was talking about is truly a scarcity mindset or not. Yeah, I just, always- I think I'm being realistic. I mean, yeah. you think of all the TV shows that you bailed on in the middle. Oh, for sure. Right. And, and so think of all the work that that person, that that TV show did to get you to try that first episode. Right. And think of how at some point you were actually enjoying it. And then one day it just wasn't important for you anymore. And and right. the, and the problem from my perspective, like from the TV show's perspective, if they lose enough viewers, then they don't get to make the show anymore and it just ends. But those people go on to be producers and writers of other television shows. I'm never going to make a thing this popular ever again. Right. This is your thing. Yeah, and, and I don't mean like I can't lose my thing. I mean, I can't just decide to go help people a second time. It it, it very well may not work again. And and I and to to give you context for that, I've been talking about this a lot this week because of the 10 million, but media will tell you there's like over 4 million podcasts. That's not true. There's hmm. like 4 million parked RSS feeds, meaning somebody was like, I'm going to make a podcast about pumpernickel bread. 
I'm going to lock down that feed. I'm going to like, I'm going to register the pot, the pumper nickel podcast, which I don't think you can make a whole podcast about, but I do love the title. And, um, and so there are a lot of lockdown titles, like the way people used to sit on and probably do still sit on, like they squat on URLs, like they'll buy a, you know, something.com thinking they're going to use it later and they never do. So that happens a lot with podcasts. So anyway, there's yeah. a, a certain amount of actually active podcasts, but only I think it's about a million or half a million, excuse me. There's about a half a million podcasts that actually put up an episode at least once a month. And wow. of them, 95 or 96% of them don't get enough downloads to interest an advertiser. Wow. So you know, so there's just, a very small percentage of podcasts like yours that has enough Meet downloads that yep. that that a, an advertiser would say well this would this would be a valuable place to put my advertising dollars. And yeah. the reason that's important is because if you don't have advertising then you can't treat it like a full-time job. And right. and there's an episode out today with Stephen. It's called I think it's called Stephen Appleseed. And Oh, I've already listened. Oh, okay, great. So you have, wow. Hey Hannah, how are you? Thank you. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Hey, if our uh, spouse. It was great. I, I listened to it on my walk this morning. It was great. Oh, cool. So, so Stephen is making a point at some point in there about all the quality content that he has heard from people with diabetes over the years, but how none of it ever gained like mass exposure. Yeah, it didn't gain traction. Right. I'm, I am one of the only people who's ever done that. Well, and that, that's interesting you say that because I now remember when I chose to start listening to your podcast, I clicked on it because it said diabetes. And I saw that there was a download from that day. So I was like, oh, it's current. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's an active podcast and they're going to keep, he's going to keep making episodes. Yeah. So uh, sometimes you click on a podcast, but the last episode was six months ago or a year ago. And so I wouldn't be drawn to listen to that one. Right. Do you have any idea if you go look how many podcasts, the last episode that went live says, we're just going to take a break for Christmas, but we'll be right back. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. Because it's hard to make a podcast, Anna. And it's oh, it's sure. demanding in time and all that stuff. And and so anyway, like I wasn't boasting before. Like like I'm one of the few people who has created a thing that's gained uh, what content creators might call escape velocity. Like, yeah. like I'm, I, I am... I get to decide how this goes and, and it's not like, like, listen, there are other podcasts and they have advertisers, but I guarantee you there are advertisers are giving them 20, $40 to put an ad on it. Like it's not yeah. enough. It's not enough to live off of. They have an advertiser and it looks good, but it's not a real, it's not a real business model, I guess, if that makes sense. And so you have to make, you have to find a balance between this sustaining itself financially and it helping people. And I have, in my opinion, I have struck that balance. So that's great. Yeah. And, and now we're getting to the point where people who aren't medical related are starting to ask about advertising on the show. Oh, wow. And I think that's where, that's when my freedom will really like crank open. Do you know what I mean? When you like, have that I, freedom, I, are you going to change the structure of the podcast? Or are you always going to keep it the same kind of structure. I can't see changing how it works at all. Like I like the three conversations, one medical episode a week. Like yeah. I, I like that format. I like that the medical episode is generally speaking shorter. Mm -hmm. I like that like hearing you talk about long form content was really exciting for me because I believe people want to hear long conversations because they're real. But I yeah. but I but there are people that the management based people who are mostly the Facebook based people are like, no, like, it, it, I don't, I don't want to hear a two hour conversation with a girl who thought about hurting herself when she was 12, but I do like, I right. want, I want to hear that conversation. So I'm doing the thing that you hear most creative people do. I'm making yeah. a thing that I would listen to. Yeah. Well, and it is listenable. I, I mean, I, I choose to listen to it every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, keeping, because it's people's stories and there's always something to relate to and there's something that draws you into a, someone's story and someone's experience rather than facts like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. My, my son tried to say to me a couple months ago, he's like, are you ever going to make that podcast bigger than, than diabetes? And I said, it is. 
And, yeah, oh, for sure. And, and, he, and he's like, what do you mean? He's like, every day you talk to somebody who has diabetes or is like the caregiver of somebody with diabetes. It's about diabetes. I'm like, it's not. Like, it, it is and it isn't. Like, I think there's something amazing about hearing every conversation in the world, but everyone you're talking to has, like, like there's insulin in their refrigerator, you know? Yeah, that, that there's that one commonality. Yeah, no, I, I love that. About I wonder, it. I wonder how many people listen that don't have diabetes or don't aren't a caregiver. I would, I would think it's pretty low. Yeah, it's a shame because there are episodes of this podcast that have little or nothing to do with type one that are really good episodes. Like, did you hear Perry last week? Uh, I don't, I don't know if I after dark California sober. Oh yes. Okay. That episode could have been in any podcast. Yes. Yeah, it does. It it he's got but diabetes. No, but but someone without that that not associated with diabetes isn't going to listen to it. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a it's a good yeah. podcast episode, and I have a lot like that. I I believe that I have a lot of episodes that are like that, and yeah. and and it might never, it might never find people who don't have type one or diabetes in general. But that's okay to me because it for the people who did find it. I hear enough from them that this is their favorite podcast, not just their favorite diabetes podcast. And that mm. to me means the same thing. I'm I'm probably never going to get to like, you know, I'm probably never going to get to like 5 million a month, but I don't care as long as it's reaching people with diabetes. It doesn't matter to me if it gets past that. Yeah, there's probably, there's going to be a ceiling, but it's still going to reach people. And, there, and I think that like I share it with anyone that I know that has diabetes or um, I don't know if they'll listen to it, but I just tell them about it. Um, and so this word of mouth is powerful too. Yeah. Uh, so pe- people share it. It's the only way, honestly. Yeah. The word of mouth is the only thing that works. My goal is a million a month. That's I, that's what I'm trying to get to, a million downloads a month. How close are you? I'm halfway there. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's what I'm shooting for. I want to, I want to get to a, I want to get to 12 million a year and then I'll reassess it and see what's what's happening because of the 10 million that just happened. And I want to be clear for people. Like it's not, it's 10 million lifetime. Like I started the podcast in 2015. It right. took four years to get to a million. And then it only took one more year to get to 2 million. Mm-hmm. And then there was a couple years in there that did really well, but they weren't like extravagantly well, but the last 5 million came in like the last 12 months. Yeah. So now we're onto it now. Like we're getting there. So, and that escape velocity is important because it gives you freedom to do other things. Like you can tell somebody to go to hell if you want to. Right. <laughs> you know, not that I haven't so far, by the way, I, I, I really should say that the advertisers I have, I'm actually very proud of them. I think I have a lot of gold standards in diabetes care as advertisers. I think the advertisers are great. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And they're very supportive of the show, and I have no reason to want to walk away from them. I have, I'm not saying that. But just the idea that I could, you know, is is freeing. I, yeah. I don't know why. But, you know, and there's even a part of me that thinks, like, like at one time, it's going to stop. Like, I mean, you guys don't know this, the, the pressure I live under. But if you don't use those links, I'm going to lose those advertisers. I, I, I live in that reality every day. And, oh, wow. and so – when I lose the advertisers, I lose the show. Like it's gone. And then mm-hmm. the next Hannah just doesn't get this because you think, oh no, the podcast will be there forever, but it doesn't work that way. Like content right. gets content that isn't new gets stale and it disappears. Yeah. The the difference between a compendium of information that'll help people and a book that nobody looks into is the newness of the show. Have you ever thought about reposting old episodes like because people haven't heard them yeah you know number like random numbers in the 200s or 300s like that i wouldn't necessarily go and scroll to find but if you were to post it and it was up you know tomorrow i might listen to it i wouldn't even know that it was from two years ago would you ever do that i just had a conversation online with people and i asked that question if on friday i ran a best of episode kind of thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. Would that bother you? And most people were okay with it, but they wanted it clearly branded. Oh, to to clearly show that this is a repost. Yeah. Like this is, this is a, this is a reposted episode. Now 
would I do that? I don't see why I, I don't see why I shouldn't. Like, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I think it would bring out those episodes to people who haven't seen them yet. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's a good idea. Uh, and I thought so when I had the conversation. The truth is that after I thought to ask people about it and came to the conclusion that it was a good idea, I forgot that I was thinking about it. So I just pulled up my to-do list so I can add it. Yeah, you could do repost Fridays or something. Yeah, right. And But that's... That's so interesting because I had a, an entire day where I thought about that. Then I had conversations with people to make sure that, I, like, am I thinking about this correctly? And then I thought, I think this is a good idea. And then until you just brought it up, I didn't remember that I had ever done that. And yeah. it's because, I mean, there are a few people who help me with the Facebook group. They're very helpful. Yeah. And there's this girl named Angela who's been helping me lately with stuff. Like, there's a, it'll be gone by the time people hear this, but there's a survey right now about for listeners of the podcast which has been like, I, yeah, I think I took that one. Oh my God. It's got like 700 responses already. So thank you. Like, That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. The, the person who made the the survey for me is a, a MPH grad from Hopkins. And she, cool. and she said, she sent me a text the other day. Hold on a second. I'm going to find it. Cause what she said was we were talking about the survey. Hold on. I know I'm like, this is boring, but give me a second. Even prestigious medical research groups struggle to produce surveys with this many active participants. Wow. And I was like, ah, oh, cool. Uh, and and so like that kind of stuff, like people are helping me behind the scenes with things like that. They're all very lovely people. But the production of this podcast and the worry about it and all the meetings with the advertisers and all the other stuff that has to happen, and sending out invoices, which by the way, I'm not good at, is it, it's all me. It's all and, you. Yeah. yeah. And so I would like to share it, but I don't know how to do that. Honestly, I, I think they're part of the reason why it works is because it all begins and ends with what I think is the thing I want to do. Yeah. There is something to be said about delegation though. I, I used to be a, a varsity softball coach mm -hmm. and I, I had to learn really quick that I had to delegate things in order to accomplish what I wanted to, which you have to put a lot of trust in people, but you also have to influence them in the, the direction you want to go. Yeah. Which I, I'm growing like that a little bit. I have a, I have a, an art student right now making like art for me that I'm not involved in. So yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to use it. I have to see it, but like, I, I at least was like, Oh, I can do that. Cause I realized I'm like, oh, this podcast is big enough. This would look good on their portfolio. Oh, sure. I was like, why am I not taking an intern on art? I should be doing that. So. Cause there's so many people that are pro a part of, a part of the, the Facebook group who have been impacted that have certain gifts and abilities that may be able to contribute, you know, you just have to find them or, or be willing to try it. But, but also going back to the repost Friday, if you repost Friday, there's not much to be lost in that. I don't like you may, those specific ones may not get as many views, but you'd still probably get more downloads per week. You see, I don't worry about them not getting views. I worry about them pissing somebody off. And then that person just stops listening. That's my bigger concern. Ah, so should I be concerned about that? I don't think so. Well, I don't you, know. You don't think so because you've only been listening for six months and I saved your life and all that stuff. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but like, you know, somebody who's been listening for four years might be like, just wake up in a bad mood one day and be like, here, I'll give you an example. There is a person who's been following this podcast forever. I know them from online, always been a lovely person. I thought always a little strange, but not, never in a weird way, just in a lovely different way. And about like three months ago, they just turned on me. Oh, And I like, I, I mean, look, there are 34, as of this recording, there are 34,000 people in my Facebook group. Yeah. I'm maybe aware of 200 of them by their avatar and because their name sticks in my head for weird reasons. As far as their posting style, I maybe only know five of them and those are usually problem people yeah, because they get brought because exactly. they get brought to my attention right this is not a this is a person i knew of if you showed me their avatar i would have thought nice lady and i have like a generally like good feeling about them yeah but all of a sudden out of nowhere just like came at me like you like you don't care about people anymore and like I'm like what in the hell like I haven't changed the way I make this podcast at all I'm completely open about the fact that there are advertisers you know like and it's just it's all about the ads now and I'm like I 
I did something one day that just rubbed this person wrong and they just like flipped like a light switch. But I also, I don't know if that has to do with you as much as it has to do with them and maybe a circumstance in their life that then came out towards you. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe I, as somebody told me the other day, I'm not listening to the podcast anymore because you have athletic greens as an advertiser. Oh, and I'm like, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, like, I, I don't know what to say. Like, it, like it, it, this is a person who told me previously, this podcast was a really great help to me. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I, I don't like, look, it's athletic greens. It's a green drink, drink it or don't yeah. drink it. I, so- <laughs> you don't have to buy it. Like nobody's making you do it. You know, like, and, and it's an, like, do you, like, I wanted to say when you're watching tennis on CBS in the afternoon and an, and an ad comes on for something that you don't, I don't know. Well, I don't even know what the person's problem was with it, but, but you, you don't have a good feeling about, do you shut the tennis match off? Do you go, oh, I can no longer watch tennis on CBS because they like Downey. <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, what in God's name? Like, what kind of a thought is that? And so I am aware, and now these people are very few and very far between these interactions, Yeah. but it's still in the back of my head. I don't know how many of those people am I going to piss off if I run an extra episode on Fridays, even though I do think it's valuable for people who haven't heard them before, who won't think to go back. And I could easily, you know, I could easily ask the people who listen and love the podcast, make me a list of episodes that you think should be like best of material. Yeah. And, and they would come up with the great, with great ideas for people. Yeah. Man, I don't know. I should just do it. I shouldn't give a crap what happens and just do it. Yeah. And I'll blame you if it goes wrong. How's that sound? I'll, I'll take that. Sure. Will you, will you pay my kids tuition? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well then I don't know how far you're going to take you, it. Then. If it doesn't, if, if you feel like it's not working, you could just stop doing it too. Yeah. I'm teasing too. I don't actually think it'll be a problem. It's just one of the things that I'm tasked with worrying about because it's my you're podcast. Yeah. Right. So yeah, this, this, these are my hells. Okay. They're not so bad. So I'm not complaining about them. They're just, they're just the things I'm, you know, I, that I think about during the day when I'm making this thing anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, this was terrific. Thank you very much. You, uh, Thank you, you like much. long conversations and you gave one. So I appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. No, it was really, it was really lovely. You're, you're terrific. Can you hold on one second for me? Yes. Thank you. How about Hannah giving a great podcast interview? Thank you so much. And I also want to thank Cozy Earth and remind you to use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout to save 40% off of your entire order. CozyEarth.com. Who else was today's podcast sponsored by? Do you remember? I can tell you. US Med. USMed.com forward slash JUICEBOX or call 888-721-1514. Do your business with US Med just like we do. You know, at the end of the Cozy Earth ad, like way back there, I was just like, go buy towels. I thought, this is how I should do all the podcasts. I'd be like, go get a, go get a stuff. Go get stuff. Use the link. So articulate. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast.